And uh, at this point, I would love to transition to how do we take this head, heart, core exercise? And how do we actually turn this into speeches, speaking careers, mes uh, messenger careers, however you identify? And how do we actually translate that into the real world? And I have two panelists here today who have done that incredibly successfully. And so I would love to bring out at this point um, Nicole DeBoom and Austin Eubanks. Please give them a round of applause. Have a seat, have a seat. I'm just gonna do my Oprah thing now, I guess. Okay. My sunglasses. Yeah, totally, right? <laughs> Getting a tan. Okay. So, first of all, welcome. Thanks. I am going to read the formal bios, but then I might want to hear your own little versions as well. <laughs> I need, you can put your own little yeah. spins on them. So meet Nicole DeBoom. She actually has graced this very stage several years ago, actually. It was our first one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Early adopter. Okay, so a former professional athlete and Ironman champ, Nicole DeBoom started women's athletic wear brand Skirt Sports in 2004 to fill a gap in the male-dominated sports apparel industry. High performance clothing, clothing that is comfortable fit women's bodies and are actually cute. <laughs> Today's Skirt Sports products are sold online through retailers around the world and in their Boulder retail store. Oh my gosh, it's a fashion show, ladies and gentlemen. Look, oh, are you just robing again? Okay. Sorry. She actually has done that before. <laughs> I mean, I know your sports bra is cool, but um, <laughs> she also founded Running Start, a nonprofit that offers women with serious barriers all the tools they need to compete and complete their first 5K and change their lives. No longer a competitive triathlete, Nicole lives and plays in Boulder with her husband Tim and seven-year-old daughter Wilder. Welcome. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, don't you feel formal now? So, Austin. Austin Eubanks is an expert in the addiction, recover, addiction treatment industry and a nationally recognized speaker and media contributor on topics surrounding drug policy, behavioral health, addiction, and trauma. An injured survivor of the Columbine shooting, Austin's traumatic experience as a teen was the catalyst to his painful journey through addiction. He has since devoted his career to helping those who have turned to substances as a result of trauma. Austin has spoken to millions across the nation regarding his personal journey, as well as strategies for addressing the issues around substance abuse that are plaguing the nation. His work and personal story has garnered the interest of countless major media outlets, including People Magazine and the New York Times. Austin has provided expert commentary for Face the Nation, Rolling Stone, CBS This Morning, NBC Nightly News, and CNN. Please welcome Austin. It's the, it's the most awkward part of public speaking, is when they read your bio and you say, I don't know where to look, you know. what to do with my hands. <laughs> I think you're supposed to just crawl under your chair, yeah, like no one notices like, you. I just and, look down. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Well, Austin, maybe we'll start with you. Um, so what's kind of your version of your own bio? How do you introduce yourself? I mean, that's the formal version, but... Yeah, um, I, I'm just a person trying to figure out how to navigate this crazy world we live in. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, since coming into recovery, I've kind of just tried my best to do the next right thing. And when doors opened, I walked through them and some doors closed and I went the other way and that's kind of how I came to speaking. Um, it was, I got pushed to go in that direction and I took a leap of faith and did it. And shortly after I started speaking was when I met you and then to TEDx and then from there it just kind of, exploded. So now I'm on the road over 100 days a year and and uh, I'm trying to manage that because that comes with a ton of stress and uh, it hasn't been easy at all. So yeah. that's me. Well, when I met Austin, you had recently, well, we're getting the TEDx Mile High talk mm -hmm. and, um, and I was so excited because his story is incredibly compelling and especially with my background in violence prevention and I, I just remember when, when we first met, just being absolutely riveted, not only by your story, but, but I'm always curious about how people respond to it and what happens afterwards. And maybe, maybe you can just share a few thoughts about how, how do you feel like your response to something like a Columbine is different or unique or what you want to share with the world? 
Well, I, I think that Columbine is one of those sentinel events. For anybody who's over the age of 35, 35 to 40, most people remember Oklahoma City bombing, Columbine, 9-11. Those are the three. So everybody has an emotional attachment to it. So it naturally draws people, I think, to that story more than perhaps other traumatic events would. And so for me, that presents a number of challenges because it was, it was very real. And for a lot of other people, it was what they saw on television. And then, you know, the way that we're having to navigate now with this happening at an ever greater rate, unfortunately, I've had the opportunity to work in many communities that have been affected by these tragedies. Um, and so being able to lend kind of my experience, strength, and hope to them to where they don't experience the same adversity that I did has been very rewarding. But every story that people share about their trauma or how they were impacted is something that then I carry with me. And I've had to learn how to keep myself emotionally healthy because there's been so many setbacks where I've had some pretty significant implosions just over the past two years since I started speaking, because when people look to you as the guy with all the answers, it's almost like you develop two different versions of yourself. And this person back here isn't always healthy, but this person up here does know a lot of the right things to say. So um, that's the landscape I've been trying to navigate. Yeah, I know, Nicole, you too have navigated that a bit too. I mean, a lot of people who know Nicole, she's this very, outgoing, bubbly, fun, but lately, I mean, the past few years, I mean, you go for it with some of the topics that you've been speaking on. Can you say a little bit about that? Sure, okay, well first, um, you guys, do you know that I met Erin on a playground by saving her child's crying woes with gummy bears, <laughs> right? Mom love, right there. Yeah. You we just... didn't know we didn't know each other yet, but um, so we go way back, and I feel very like connected and open with Aaron. And when Aaron invites people into a room, I feel very connected and open with the room. And so that's one of the things I think I was thinking about why we're all here today. I'm here because Aaron asked me to come, and because I follow and support everything Aaron does and believe in it wholeheartedly, because it does help you grow. And I think that's why we're really here is we're seeking personal growth, right? So um, you ask, like, so on the outside, I mean, I have had the coolest life. Like, I've done all these cool things. I was a pro athlete. Um, I have explored the world through sport. Um, I started a business. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I started a nonprofit. You, she didn't mention I started a podcast, of which Erin was one of my more recent guests, and we actually made her kind of dig herself on the podcast. So it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> it's like, I can't believe people pay me to do this to them. Uh, but it doesn't mean that I haven't had to push through my own difficulties along the way. And I wouldn't say overcome because it's an evolution. You never truly overcome things. But I am over 10 years sober myself. I had a long history with um, alcohol abuse. Um, I am in a marriage that is not perfect by any means. Um, I've had to tackle what it means to have a business where everything, you know, and everybody's uh, well-being relies on you, and that can be really difficult and create stress at times. So, you know, uh, and and along the way, I had to let my ego go, and I think that's a really big part of what happens, which might just be called maturity. <laughs> I don't know, but once you finally can let your ego go, I think you can accept who you truly are, and then once you gain some courage, you can maybe take the steps to put it out there in the world, and that, I think, creates growth. Austin, you were saying earlier about how sometimes the guy that people see out there and the guy that's like going home to your house at night are different and at odds. How do you make peace with that when maybe you, sometimes we don't feel like the expert, right? Like we don't feel like we've figured it all out. So who am I to go out there and talk about it? You know, how do you reconcile it? Well, it's a learning process. And for me, I, I think that's a learning process that I'm, I'm still in. And so, you know, we, we talk a lot about speaking truth. And, and so in order to effectively speak truth, it comes with authenticity and vulnerability. Um, and those are things that I wasn't always prepared to show in front of rooms of psychiatrists or physicians or hospital associations. It's like you want to be the guy with all the answers up there. Um, and now I'm learning more to, to re-engage with that place of authenticity and, and truly get back to speaking from the heart and the core as opposed to 
the head, like you, you talked about earlier, because I think we're all prone to that. It's like I can sit up there and talk about facts and consumption rates and brain chemistry and all of that stuff, but um, what, what truly makes me effective and able to engage with the audience is when I do connect from a place of vulnerability, authenticity, and transparency. Um, and getting back to that is, is, was something that was very important to me, because I lost that along the way. Do you think that just having trauma is something that prevents us sometimes from wanting to put ourselves out there? And sometimes is that a good choice to hold back? Well, yeah, I mean, you do have to keep yourself safe and you have to mm -hmm. know when it is appropriate to, to offer and how much to offer. But I think absolutely, I mean, trauma mm -hmm. is a roadblock. It, it, it's, it's one of the, the key things that makes people put up those walls to keep themselves safe. Mm -hmm. um, but, but for me, you do have to learn how to keep a healthy balance, especially when you're in the public eye, mm -hmm. um, because you don't want to just lay it all out there, you know, air all of your dirty laundry. But at the same time, you, you want to hold on to the part of you that, that, that makes you unique and that makes your message authentic. And you want to mm -hmm. feel like your, your life and who you are as a person is congruent with what you're displaying to the public. Mm -hmm. um, and that can sometimes become a struggle. Yeah, this is kind of for both of you. Do you have you both found that your message has evolved over time? Oh yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think the things that are hard to talk about, I think it for me, I had to take baby steps to bringing them out into the public. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I wasn't just like, oh, hey everyone, I had a drinking problem for all these many years of my life. It was like I kind of mentioned once or twice in a talk here or there. I didn't say much about it, but I started to kind of test the waters. And then on that topic, I was invited to come back to this stage. Aaron was on stage with me, and there, one of your former clients as well, Kelly McNellis, put on an event called the Truth Teller Tour, and she said, just come up here and speak one of your truths. And I was like, do you want to know what I'm going to talk about? She's like, nope. Just come up here and talk your truth. And I actually did a talk about that topic for the first time, and it was a really interesting um, I, I, re I practiced it, but I didn't memorize it. And I knew the points I wanted to hit on. And then I got up on stage and I sat down afterwards and I was like, what did I say? I don't even remember. Like what, <laughs> what just, just happened? happened? <laughs> it came out. And, um, and it was emotional. And when, when your true emotion comes out on stage and it's real and authentic and not like you're fake crying, you know, um, I think the audience really understands that too, and it and it brings something out in them. And I think that's the beauty of public speaking is that the spoken word is so powerful, and we know that. And in person, it's even more powerful than on a screen. And uh, and people really, when you have true emotion and you let it come out in whatever way it's going to come out, people feel that, and you can have more impact and more power through being vulnerable, mm -hmm. through fighting through those things that used to bring you shame or embarrassment, and remembering that these are just other human beings who also have those feelings about things in their life, and by you sharing, it might help them feel more open themselves. I do totally agree with that. There is something about a ripple effect that happens when we start speaking our truth, all of a sudden, it's almost like permission can be contagious. And it's almost like it allows people to, to share their truth as well. And for you, Austin, when you spoke at TEDx Mile High, was that a was that a shift for you? Is that it felt like a the talk was incredible. If you guys haven't seen it, just Google it. But um, I remember what some of your universal truths were around um, what you don't know about pain mm -hmm. is is killing us. Yeah, so I mean, I think that that was really the framework that constructed my message. And, and that was by far the most intimidating talk that I've ever done, because that was very early in my speaking career, too. I had only been speaking publicly for a little while, and I definitely wasn't doing it professionally yet. So um, that, was, that was kind of the tipping point. But that, that message is what I've continued to evolve over time. So you talk about a message changing, and mine very much has. So it started out very much as the correlation between trauma and addiction and our inability to heal from emotional pain and why we're, we're turning to all these medicators at an ever greater rate. But as I continued to speak about that and I, I would meet with people in the audience and I would hear their stories, you continue to weave kind of this golden thread. And so now what I talk about 
is, is much broader and it resonates with a much wider audience because I'm looking at the cultural implications of that. Like why are we disproportionately affected by so many of these issues, whether it's teen suicide and depression or the addiction pandemic or the polarization in politics. And, and so there's a theme between all of that and I believe it's because we are, we are being torn away from authentic human connection, from the transparency and the authenticity and vulnerability at an ever greater rate and by and large, it's because everything that we use in our lives today is designed to be addictive. And when that happens, it has to be all-encompassing. It has to allow you to detach and disconnect. And so a lot of the technology that we are being sold as bringing us closer together is actually ripping us further apart. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's long ago time that we accepted that many of the industries in this country are, are targeting the most vulnerable aspects of us as a species in the interest of profit. And so now my message has really evolved to perhaps be more of a, a legislative one than uh, a clinical one. Mm, nice. That is an interesting thing when we build these tools that connect and they actually build disconnection. Mm -hmm. It's what a vicious cycle. I'm sorry, someone just texted me. I need to check <laughs> it quick. Hold on. I think it's Jenny Brown in the front row here. She's, she's like, I got to go do something. Um, are there any questions in the crowd? I'm always just curious to take your pulse if there's anything coming up. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So nothing is either all good or all bad. You can say that about anything. Uh, the problem becomes when it's in control and we're no longer in control of it. So most of us in this room had a significant advantage. When we first held a smartphone, we had a fully myelinated brain. Uh, developing brains don't have that. And so I often talk about, you know, pay attention at a restaurant just over the next week and you'll see a toddler get upset. They're going to be handed a smartphone or a tablet and the emotion's going to shut off, just like if you were to medicate it with substances. Um, and so the, it starts with having conversations about it. You're right, we're not going to roll that back. But the key piece to that for me is that we have to start focusing on increasing the emotional intelligence of youth as opposed to just focusing on their IQ or obedience training that our education system often does. Um, and, and you know, I, it's my belief that we're producing generations of youth that are less resilient and less emotionally intelligent than perhaps ever before in history by way of the technology that is all encompassing that they're being given at a very, very early age. Thanks. It's really hard not to hand your little kid a phone, though, right? Yeah. And, and healthy boundaries around it, too. You know, an hour a day, two hours a day, that's not going to hurt, but it's the four, six, eight hours a day that we're often seeing, so. Final question I have for both of you is, what, what is one piece of advice that you would give to someone, maybe sitting in this room right now, who has a story to share, has been through something, who knows something, who has some kind of expertise, and they're on the verge of wanting to get it out there? and maybe feeling a little hesitant for whatever reason. You go first. So my biggest thing, and, and I had this happen uh, just a few months ago. We were just talking about this backstage. But I walked, I, I, I often, my schedule's so busy, I don't really pay attention to what's coming next. It's just like in three-day chunks. And so I showed up in an event, and it was the National Pharmacist Conference. And there was an audience of 3,500. And I had the keynote on Saturday, and Magic Johnson had it on Sunday. And I had that epiphany where I was like, how did I get here? And, and really it was because I just took the courage to stand up, speak from the heart, and keep doing it again and standing up. And my message really evolved over time. I used to not be able to eat before I spoke. I couldn't sleep the night before. It didn't come easy. Uh, but I just kept showing up and I kept drilling down that message. So my, my advice for anybody is just you have to take that first step, whether it starts at Toastmasters or in rooms like this or if you're in recovery at an AA speakers meeting or something like that. Um, you get stronger every time you do it and you just have to keep showing up. I like that. Um, I will second the fact that you just have to start. Like you, if you're never going to do anything if you don't start. And starting doesn't have to be like on a big stage here. It can be anywhere, like Austin just said. Um, my word from my dig is relationship. I was already speaking before I met Aaron. I just wasn't speaking as effectively, but I was doing it. And you're going to know from the first time you get up there in front of people if it's something that, 
that brings you joy, if it's something that inspires you, if it's something that you can see yourself doing in a bigger and better way. And uh, there doesn't have to be any magic to how you start. Most things in your life, you're probably not going to remember the first time you did them. You know, you just all of a sudden one day you're like, wow, I've been doing this. I don't actually remember my first talk ever. But, um, but once you realize that it's something that holds promise for you and, uh, and whether it can help you grow or you think that you are being called to help others grow, that's when you get more serious and you take those bigger steps. But right now, just start. You can start on podcasts. You don't even, no one even has to see you. How cool is that? <laughs> You know, you can start in small groups. You can start uh, speaking at a kid's school with an audience that really doesn't care what you have to say. <laughs> like, just get started. And also on that note, you can also end things, too. You know, when they're no longer working for you or you've evolved in a certain way. And one of the fun things for me, having so many people on this stage today, I've seen some degree of their evolution over years. And it's just been cool to watch both of you get out there and, and do what you do and just keep growing and keep moving and keep pushing ourselves. So thank you both so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Give a big round of applause. All right.